call the Community Services Committee to order at about 2.17. And uh, Curtis, would you like to do the please. Precious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Be with us, Lord, as we go through the committee meetings. We pray, pray for knowledge, Lord. We pray for wisdom. And uh, just, just help, help us as we make our decisions today. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey, Here. Frankie Vargas. Present. Bill England. Jack Baker. Here. Joe Bird. Julia Tess. Jody Fishenkamp. Here. Meredith Raley. Janelle Fulbright. Here. Don Garvin. Chuck Hoskin Jr. Here. Curtis Snell. Here. 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 David Thornton. Oh, man. David Walkenstick. Carrick Allen Wallace. We do have a quorum. Okay. Thank you. Entertain the motion for approval of the minutes. Make a motion to be approved. Second. Motion seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Pass. Uh, reports on human services. I think Kara Whitfield is going to come forward. First of all, Kara, let me thank you and all the folks who were at Claremore in the heat about a week or so ago, and whoever was there, thank you for sticking with it up there. Thank you very much. Um, we actually um, wanted to um, uh, um, show some of the people that were actually at Claremore today. We asked them to come today. A lot of them had other commitments and things like that today, but we were um, we were under a situation where we weren't expecting to not have air conditioning, and um, uh, they kept trying to fix it. And about I can't remember what time it was. They they um, decided they couldn't fix it, and so. Um, we were we were in a situation where we had lots of citizens there who still wanted those um, vouchers, and so we we felt like we had to um, provide another option of giving them another opportunity to come. Um, so we did another Claremore side the other week. So we appreciate you um, acknowledging that it was a lot of hard work. And I actually have um, Michelle Lopez, if she will come. She's the coordinator. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I am sending in for Ms. Lamb, and she is um, not available today. I, I do have um, a couple of other things that I would like to um, do. The first thing I would like to do is introduce our new um, Deputy Executive Director of Human Services. A lot of you um, already are probably very familiar with her, um, Barbara Foreman. She came on um, last Monday, so we are excited to be working with her and um, our I know she comes with a wealth of experience, so we're excited to um, just be with her and, and uh, learn learn additional things as we continue in working with our, with our citizens at Human Services. So. Um, also, um, you should have received a report um, from Ms. Lamb. Um, I need you to uh, wanted to also update you on the Elders in Need program. Just wanted you to be aware that. Um, there were some updates that um, were done. Um, for example, the age was dropped down to 60. Um, the deadline has been extended until September 4th, I believe. Um, and Jerry Snell, if you have any additional questions about the updates, he's also here. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. I, I had asked last time if in the course of taking applications for the Elders in Need program, uh -huh. whether they might identify new participants in LIHE, and whether there was anything sort of structured so they could make sure you catch those folks. Do you know whether that's happening? I will, I will defer to Mr. Snell. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm way back there and I couldn't hear. Oh, uh, it, as you're taking Elder in Need program applications, are you, is there any system in place to identify people who will apply for that but aren't participating in LIHEAP and maybe we need to get them to participate in LIHEAP? Is, is there a way yes. to catch those folks? As a matter of fact, we had 98 that uh, we've served so far that have not had any connection with LIHEAP. What we'll be doing, we'll be mailing them out a letter and uh, giving them an invitation to come in and make a LIHEAP application. So, 
Thank you very much. And, and the one other question, Mr. Chairman, was um, do they get to identify which utility company they want to direct their $200 to? Yes, they do. Okay. They can, uh, again, we've had them to do everything from water and sewer to uh, propane, natural gas, electricity, whichever, is. Wish, yeah, whichever utility they wish to, to have paid. Very good. Thank you very much, Chairman. Okay, uh, Jerry. Okay. <laughs> I like I <laughs> 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 okay, he's talking about that elder and me. Would you would you mind uh, asking the uh, administration to do an analysis on changing that from sixty five to sixty two years of age to be to qualify for that elders and needs? Okay, what we already done, we dropped the age limit to the age of sixty. Okay. At the age of 60. With our initial program, we served 880 clients that were 65 years of age and older. And of course, we wanted, did I say six? It was 800, 841 that we served 65 and older. No, I'm talking about that 200 for six months, right? Right. Uh, so we went ahead, since we hadn't served a year as many clients as we felt like we should, we dropped that age limit to uh, 60. Okay. It happens to be the same <coughs> age that we use for our lighting program. Mm -hmm. to classify that's, that's good. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, also, food distribution to you. Are you over there? Or? Yes. What would you have to go through to have the elders in food distribution receive uh, a fourth more food than what they receive now, or half additional food to what they receive now? It would and, have. Go ahead, sorry. And what what my biggest problem is in my part of the country is that these elders are taking care of their grandkids, and and they run out of food about the third week. So if we could find out some way, if we had to put some funding in on it or some way to give these elders additional food for the month would, would really help these people. And you know, USDA actually sets the, uh, the food packet, okay. how much each household member should receive. And what happens a lot of times with those elders, they don't report that they have grandchildren in the household. Yeah. If they reported it, they would get they would get a food packet for well, each, each child. A lot of them are, are getting them after school. And, you know, when kids come home hungry, and them grandparents go feed them. They don't care if they run out of food or not. But uh, is there any way that we could uh, add to that program for just for the elders? We could approach USDA. It would have to be, you know, with their approval, but we'd be more than happy to. Uh, Is there any way we could do it through discretionary funding? And you couldn't. Do you not do it? it? Well, you couldn't use in USDA food. No. You know, we might be able to do it, you know, in another, in other means, but mm -hmm. you, I can't see any way off the cup. And of course, we'll we'd be more than happy to look into it. Okay. But, uh, I can't, I can't imagine us using USDA food. Yeah, for that purpose. Okay. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Carol? I'm sorry, Jerry, you're not done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, yeah. So the only change is, or the only changes on the elders type it is they're going to drop the age to 60 from 65, and they're going to extend the date to September 4th. But they are still required to live in the Cherokee Nation, and there's still income requirements. Then another question, are you going to be here during this, uh, the first agenda item for the resolution on the USDA food commodity foods? Because we have additional questions. Okay, okay don't leave. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Better go study that. Huh? <laughs> Don? I was wanting to ask you a question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I have an easy one for you. Every two years, the National Council on Aging has their meeting, and I think last year it might have been Michigan, year four in Milwaukee, but this year it's in Albuquerque. Do we have 
people going. I know it has been possible for take a bus load of elders to those meetings. Can you bring us up to date? I yes, we we will have staff attending. At this point in time, we're not planning on taking any elders. It has it's been a major major issue. Well, for years, because there's no way that we can take, for instance, all the elders that participate in our senior nutrition program. And when you open it up to 30 participants, then you have 120 that uh, are disgruntled because they didn't get an opportunity to go. But I do know we had originally talked about it. It's going to cost several thousand dollars, you know, just charter a bus. To well, I was in a forum this week in the meeting with the elders, and they were asked about it. Right. And I think they've been on some other trips. <coughs> they have, and over the years we have, uh, well, at one time we had some funds that come through the tribe that we used to take our elders on, on trips. And uh, that was discontinued back a few years back. <laughs> Of course, I'm sure they're remembering some of those trips that they had. Maybe we can take some representatives from each area in the future, and maybe not this year, but two years from now. <coughs> we certainly, we'll certainly take that in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lee? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, do you have any information for us on the food distribution building in Collinsville? You know, that program, or that building was funded through HUD. Uh, uh, we did not have enough money in the very beginning to complete that. Well, we probably would have if it would have started a year and a half ago. It should have. But uh, what's happened now is that we just don't have enough funds to meet the bids that have gone out. So what the tribe is doing now they're going to serve as a general contractor and uh, attempt to build the building, you know, through the three tribal facilities. We have to get approval from HUD for that to happen. And we have the letter of request in, and uh, we're hoping that we'll get a response in the next week. We were told last week that the person that could make that decision was out of the office but would be back today. And uh, so hopefully this week we'll get a decision on whether HUD will let us be the general contractor for that project. And if so, uh, we feel like we're going to have enough money to continue it. If we, if we don't get HUD approval, it's going to be tough. Can, can you let the uh, District 5 people know that as soon as you find out the information? Sure can. Because I do remember a few months ago or longer I asked about it. And, uh, I can't remember who it was. Someone answered that there was no sense, of, no urgency about it, that everything was fine. And so this is well, the, the urgency I felt from the word go was that we had a little over five hundred thousand dollars for that project, and all the bids were coming in six hundred plus, and uh, there wasn't enough dollars at that time to release a bid. So. Uh, that's why they're attempting to go the direction that they are. <clears throat> and we will keep you informed. Hopefully, we'll get an answer. Hopefully, this week. Okay, please, please let us know. I'm sure you will. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. Did, did you try to rebid that, or can, can you rebid it? It was rebid twice, and uh, <clears throat> in both instances, we could not get we couldn't get a. Uh, better to even get close to the money that we had available, but it did go out. To, it did go out twice that I know of. Was it our design or HUD design or what? Our design. It was. That was the other thing. The architect work was done under the previous administration, so it was already it was already in place and paid for, and uh, so no, it was totally our design. Did we get the money off of our design so you can't downscale and keep the money? That's what I'm getting at. Now that I don't know. We'd probably have to. We'd probably have to talk to Bruce Davis and, and uh, his division to find that out. 
Okay, so we're going to be the general contractor. That's what they're proposing to do now. And uh, they figure that it saves somewhere in a ballpark of $100,000 by serving as the general. Thank you. Jody? Um, I know uh, I was pertaining about something David Thornton said. A couple of years back, I had talked to a former chief because I have a bunch of elderly in my district that are raising their grandkids. And I thought that they had made a policy at that time that if the people are on fixed income, that they was eligible for commodities, regardless if they was over donated foods, if they was over income or not. I'm not aware of such a policy. Doesn't mean it. That's what he told me. Yeah. <laughs> Could you check in with Sure. It's been a couple of years back. Let me visit with you after this to make sure I understand okay. about that. Okay. <clears throat> Eligibility wise. Okay, I've got uh, Don and Janelle then. Jerry, I understand the blankets are in California coming this way. Uh, well, <laughs> hopefully they're in Oklahoma by now. <laughs> we haven't officially received them, but uh, uh, should be any day. What we plan on doing is as we take the LIHEAP applications this year for the elders, is going ahead and give them the benefit as they, as they make their application. So we'll be dispersing those blankets to the families that make application in December. No Are they coming by freight or freight? They'll be trucked in. I'm, I'm confident. At least that's how it has been in the past. I don't I you got a good driver here to make it. Oh, yeah. But uh, they sat in California in customs for three or four weeks. So I understand. Are they through customs now? Yes, they're through customs now. They're supposedly on the road. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Janelle? Yes. <clears throat> I don't <coughs> want to be <clears throat> out of order or anything, but I recently <laughs> went to the hearing aid doctor. He told me I had excellent hearing so either the air conditioning is awfully loud or something we're having a hard time hearing or the sound system's not working because when you're on that end of the building it's hard for us to hear it was for me a while ago i know we have a large audience here they came with the purpose of wanting to hear the nation's business and i would kindly ask that everybody speak up. Now, my family doesn't appreciate that because they tell me I talk way too loud, but we are having a hard time hearing. So I'm going to say thank you. Yes, ma'am. I hear you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Right. Um, we also have with us the Angel Tree Committee, and um, I have Brandy Lindley. I'm going to have her stand up. She's the coordinator of Angel Tree. And she wanted to come talk to you for a few minutes about the kickoff and what's going to be happening in this fall. So, Thank you. Good you. afternoon. I'm Brandy, and I have been the lead coordinator for the Cherokee Nation Angel Tree. This will be my 13th year. Um, this year, we've done things a little bit differently. We have a committee, and we've been meeting since March. And I want to go ahead and introduce them. Uh, we have Hetty Charbonneau, and we have Sally Wilson, who's also my coordinator, and we have Margaret Manchel and Patsy um, Cochran here today. And really, honestly, we just really want to give you a report, uh, basically an outline of what we do for the Angel Tree. We've given you a booklet uh, that looks like this, and it's more in details, everything that's there. And if you want to check out your county, of how many children we served in your county last year, if you'll go to Angel Tree 2011, there's a graph. So our mission of the Cherokee Nation Angel Tree is that we provide gifts for Cherokee children who are within our 14 county jurisdiction and they meet certain income guidelines uh, during the Christmas holidays. It started in the early 1990s. Uh, it was strictly for children who are in Cherokee Nation custody only or referral basis. We served about 100 children in the early 1990s and uh, the minimum type of gifts were usually donations and they'd usually get like maybe a box of crowns. However, uh, it has always been the initiative of the chief uh, to do the angel tree with us and this year is no different. Uh, the angel tree still remains the chief's initiative and as such the promotion of the angel tree comes through the chief's 
directive. Uh, although we have assistant coordinators, we have coordinators uh, in various places and we're hoping to add two more this year. And however, all of those coordinators still have to do their job plus this. The only two who are able to do it full time for two months is Sally Wilson and myself. Uh, the notice for income requirements are emailed and they're posted on the all employee email. If you look at the uh, Angel Tree Flyer 2011, there's an example of what is emailed out and we ask people to get the word out that way. Applications are taken in the outlying areas. We have a one in J, we have a coordinator in J. We have a lady who work, who does Mays County, so she goes to the Salina Clinic, she goes to Pryor and to Locust Grove. We also have a coordinator in Stillwell, in Salisaw, uh, Catoosa, and this year we're adding Muskogee and Vanita, and then we also have them in, in Tahlequah as well. If, um, if an applicant misses the deadlines at the outlying areas, because we do them in the last week of October, if they miss that there, they have two weeks in November because we, we are a big brother tree here in Cherokee County, so a lot of the trees, uh, angel trees, get together and we take applications together. And so they can come here. Now, if they miss the deadline entirely, then they just call us and we give them a date. Uh, we're strictly donation uh, project only. <coughs> and so if we have anything left uh, from donations, then we're able to help those who've missed that deadline. Applications for our tree or uh, Tahlequah are taken consecutively and collectively with other angel trees. Uh, we're uh, one of the bigger angel trees for this area. We last year we served 17 over over 1,700 children, um, and so they really do look to us because we kind of set the precedence on some things. Uh, all the applications are entered into our database, and that's how we keep track of all of our stuff. Our angels are distributed to the casinos. Uh, C and E is a very big help for us. They help us out with, they take some of our angels. Um, Hastings Hospital is now taking angels. They have their own angel tree, so we provide them with angels. Uh, and then we have a tree at the complex. Uh, on an average, 400 angels are not taken every year. 400 angels are not taken from the angel tree. And so the last couple of years, we've been able to go ahead and start shopping for those angels earlier. Because um, in Tahlequah, we don't have a place this year to house the angel tree. The last couple of years we've been in the house that's by view distribution. And it's really, we have almost 600 angels that come through Tahlequah alone. So we're now able to shop for at least 400 angels so we can go ahead and get those out too sooner. Once the gifts are returned, they're they're, we inspect them and we distribute them. That's all within two weeks. We look at every angel, make sure they're age appropriate. We do not take from any angel. However, we do have angels where the brother gets more than the sister. We'll add to the sister and try to even it out that way. We won't take. Um, after the application deadline, any of the lay participants deemed an emergency. All of our emergencies are staffed. Um, if you'll look in the Angel Tree uh, application process, that's where you can find more details on how we staff our emergencies or what is considered an emergency. The lead coordinator and the program manager, which is Teddy Charbonneau and myself, will staff those and we'll, we'll decide whether or not how much we can help them. Last year, we did uh, 1,759 children were served. Uh, again, uh, a graph is in your booklet to show you which counties were served. All of our counties were served except for one county, which was McIntosh. So we didn't have any children in McIntosh this past year. Uh, out of those uh, 1,759 children, uh, Cherokee Nation and Enterprise <coughs> Entertainment now, they provided for 573 angels. Our Hastings Hospital employees, they provided for 100 angels. Cherokee Nation employees here, they provided for 380 angels. In the communities across the United States, they provided for 306 angels last year. So when we talk about communities across the states, we have people calling us from Washington, California, wanting to sponsor one of our angels. Uh, the Tribal Council, uh, you guys also provided for 34 angels every year. 
17 boys and 17 girls. We get them to you as quickly as possible. I believe you're one of the ones that help out with that, aren't you? Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, some council members last year, they utilized the participants from the angel tree and they provided them with a turkey this last Christmas. Uh, there are some Cherokee Nation employees who choose to donate their gift cards. Uh, the last few years we've had Cherokee Nation employee Christmas party and they get a $50 gift card. Some of our employees just donate that card to us and we're able to provide four more angels that way. Uh, the fundraising proceeds that are conducted at Hastings Hospital, they now have a fundraiser every year. Uh, they have a contest between Tahlequah City Hospital and Hastings Hospital uh, to see who can raise more money uh, for the angel tree and it's all donated to us. So they do a lot of things that way. Uh, we have a 10 year old uh, little girl uh, for the last two or three years. She does, she does a coat drive in her community and she donates all those coats to the angel tree. Some of the ways that uh, other people have been able to help is just organizing a clothing or a toy drive. One of the things, we get a lot of people who do toy drives which are wonderful. Uh, last year we needed socks and underclothes, undergarments, and so we had one of those, somebody took that up for us. Uh, volunteer, we need people to help us take applications uh, in the areas. We also need people to help us shop. I mean, 400 angels is a lot to shop for. Are you pointing him out? Great. Well, <laughs> We're going to go to Woodall Flea Market or Bass Pro. <laughs> um, well, if you want to spend your money there, that's fine, but I can only take you to Walmart with my kids. Oh. <laughs> Um, and also we need help in the office, uh, especially here in Tahlequah. We have a lot of angels that come through here. Tahlequah is our main hub, um, especially if we had a bigger uh, place, because with the house we were only able to have so many people in there at one time. And then also we need somebody to become an advocate for your community. We need to get the word out, not just for the applications, because we need those people to come in and take those applications, but we also need people to help us and to donate and to take an angel if possible or do a drive. One of the things we hope to have in the future is we want a permanent um, place. Uh, I've been doing this for 13 years, so when I first started this, uh, we started in the hallways of Cherokee Nation, so we'd line up the hallways with the gifts. Uh, I've done it in a very small, cramped office. Uh, at that time, I would tell my boss, I really want a house. I said, Brandy, that's a pipe dream. And I said, no, I really do. I want a three-bedroom house. And I think that will help us. And so I got my three-bedroom house for a couple of years, so I think that pipe dreams are okay. So now I want a warehouse. I, I really believe that that would be helpful for us because we do have so much coming through. So we do need more coordinators for outlying areas. Everything's volunteer. Uh, this is not uh, my job. I do my job plus this, so I, this is a volunteer thing that we do. Uh, we have, we do have new. Uh, we're looking for one more coordinator, and I have two new coordinators coming on board. We need help with our public relations. Uh, if you guys have community meetings, anything to that effect, and you want and you want me to come and talk. I'm perfectly fine with that. I can send myself or I can send one of my other coordinators to if it's their area. We're able only to spend, if we are shopping for those children with the, um, the POs, we're only able to spend $40 per child, uh, per each child that we have to shop for. That gets them an outfit and maybe some socks and some underwear and that's it. So we, we need some help with getting more money per child. We need more volunteers, volunteers to shop, volunteers to answer the phones, anything that would help us out. Take an application would be great. And also, I would love to have um, increased tribal council involvement from you guys because if you could plug it into your community meetings and just get the word out for us to help us out and to help our people, then that's going to be so helpful. And we're going to be able to provide for more people. Uh, we one of our big projects or things that we would love to have is a barcode scanning tracking system. Uh, the Salvation Army Tree, um, Salvation Army Angel Tree, they have, if you see it on theirs, they have barcodes <coughs> that are able to scan. It really reduces down on human error on our part, so it would be helpful. And then we also would like to have a virtual angel tree um, in the future because we're getting people all over the United States that wants to help us. 
And so right now what they do is they call me and I say, okay, what kind of angel you want? And I'm going through the angels trying to figure out what they are and writing on the angel and then posted it on a, a board, a court board, and hopefully they'll get it back. So if they have like a virtual angel tree, they're going to be able to get more people to help us out with that. Uh, I also want to thank you for your time to let me just kind of explain some things. Our main angel tree kickoff is November 20th. It will be here at Tahlequah. It's always organized by Sandy Long. She does a wonderful job. And it's the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, so people can get their angels and start shopping on Black Friday. Are there any questions? Uh, Joe Burt. Yes, sir. Excellent program. Thank you. Very needy uh, in the areas that you're talking. Uh, you said there are always about 400 that are not? Yes, sir. There? Break that down in districts for us, and we'll try to accommodate. Okay. Um, well, what we do now is because at the very beginning, we already know that we're going to have 400 angels that we're going to have to shop for. So one of the things that's been very, very, very helpful is that we are able to have some, uh, we look at our account and see what kind of <coughs> donations we have in there already, and we start shopping for them right then. Um, all of our outlying areas, they go to the casinos, so most of them were provided for. The ones that aren't provided for that goes out last is because we take our applications later is the one that's in Tahlequah. Tahlequah is the ones that we shop for at the very beginning because we have the most there and then also because our Cherokee Nation Entertainment, they take care of their um, most of the outlying areas. Okay. All right. Good report. Thank you. Thank you. Did you, did you say you were spending an average of $40 a child? Yes, when we so, have to shop for them, yes ma'am. So if you're 400 short, you need $16,000. <coughs> and if you had $16,000, is that enough of a cushion to maintain your program? Every year, the, close? Um, we spout, on an average, how do would you say we spend? How much? Sixteen thousand a year or more? Oh, we spend more. We spend more. We spend about thirty thousand a year for the angel tree because we got to help. Because we have also those emergencies that come in, we got to provide for. Is the difference you're getting cash donations? Um, some of it is. We have a couple of big um, contributors to as a cash donation, and so um, most of the stuff that we get in that year will go out. So any kind of donation that we have right now, it's going to be already spent. Um, we do get some donations from C&E, and, &E and, um, and we get some donations from uh, Hastings Hospital. I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how to close the current gap that you have. I think you said you had 400 you were short. You're spending approximately $40 a person. Mm -hmm. So it would appear that you need 16000 Every year, just yeah, for a Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. Yes, and, and honestly, and I will say this, is I've been doing this for 13 years. I have not turned anybody down. I've always been able to provide something. So, um, and that's why we keep it. If it's $40, I mean, at least it's something. And so um, anybody that's called us, like, after the deadline and that calls us back, and when we tell them to call us back because they missed the deadline, we're able to provide something. And... Um, Anybody who calls us in for an emergency, we're already able to provide them. And it's mostly the only reason why we are is because of people that donate. It's an excellent program, and I'm just trying to get a handle on the money that I think you're going to need. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Lee? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, can you send us a group email, and that way we can start scheduling you, you in our community? Sure. What kind of group email would you like, sir? Well, to the council. Okay. Just saying that, just a basic report of what I just said here? Uh, no, you just, uh, you're, you're contacting us and okay. giving us your contact information, oh. and then we can go to the communities and say you're available okay. to come to speak. All right. If we want to do that, so... Yes, that would be that would be fine. And also, anybody who has a coordinator in their area, I'll give you their names as well. That'd be great. All right. Thank and, you. And you, uh, you mentioned PR. Do you have a, a press release already written or? We have on? anybody who does our PR. The Angel Tree is such a huge project, and we have to have so many people to help us because 
I can't just do it all. So our PR uh, communications will usually come with us and, and do some PR with us just to um, have the angle free kickoff. That's when it's out. Um, most of our PR with the, uh, there's a Tahlequah paper release, uh, Kid Connection, or Kids Connection. They do their, our paper release because they're, they're one of our partner trees. And so there's a release there saying when the applications are going to be taken here. Um, other than that, most of it is the flyers that are sent out to all employees and, and getting out to them. That way, also, um, a lot of our people who are on the Angel Tree have been on there for years. So a lot of it's word of mouth now. Um, and then also our communications does another press release for us when um, a substantial amount of donations will come in or somebody's done something wonderful with that. Just by looking at that, the end of October will be when you want to kind of kick that mm -hmm. off? Yes, the end of October is when we start taking applications. And, and that's where um, they'll take them in the outlying areas. And then in the first two weeks of November, uh, we take them in Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, let's see. Uh, community Services, David Sutherland. Thank you. A couple of things. Disclosure. Uh, Selvin Fields, uh, cousin of tribal counselor Curtis Smith. Uh, Little John and Claire May Gann, the son of Charles Gann, Housing Services employee. Douglas McCarter is brother to Housing Services employee Dwayne McCarter and cousin to Housing Services employee Perry Leach. Uh, Sherry Johnson is uh, her daughter Lori Dole works for Housing Services. Uh, Tiffany Stanberry and her three children. Uh, Three grandchildren, or the three children or grandkids of housing services employee, uh, Leona Allen, uh, they'll be getting a lower end apartment. Those others I mentioned was emergency assistance or handicap assistance. And then for uh, either rental assistance or college housing, we got Miko Leach, uh, father of <coughs> Joe Leach, a housing services employee. Uh, Pale Grogan, grandparents are human services employee, Dorothy Bark, and housing services employee, Floyd Bark. And Keely Godwin, mother, is housing services and pay listed uh, The other thing is the grants. Uh, the uh, youth grant still has uh, funding for 758 uh, folks. Outstanding applications is 172, so we're still in good shape there. Uh, adult grant, uh, there's 30 outstanding applications and 158 uh, available for funding. Uh, we uh, have only done one sports team since last time, so there's 48 available. we still got 12200 in the livestock show money. Uh, and that's all I've got to report today. You all probably heard that I'm leaving. And, uh, it's been good working with you all. been here for a while, so I'll probably see you all somewhere down the road. We, we appreciate you. And we just wondered, don't you like us or what? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it was just something couldn't pass up. One of them deals. Uh, Joe, you had a question? We appreciate it all the time that you served uh, the Cherokee Nation, David. You served us well. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. David, you've been exceptional in even coming up an hour away to our community and making sure that all the needs of folks are attempted to be addressed if at all possible and we really appreciate that you've been great to work with thank you and had's very fortunate to be getting you well thank you thank you uh, lee thank you mr chair i do want to echo the sentiments spoken before and thank you for coming up and spending some time with our people up in rogers county Tulsa county so enjoyed it the uh your, your presence was felt and we're going to miss you thank you thank you mr chair uh, Jeanette? Yes, thank you. I just want to say it's been a real pleasure working with you, and I appreciate your promptness and always answering our emails and phone calls. And I really do appreciate you. I sincerely, really hate for you to leave. And, but best wishes to your new endeavors. Thanks. Thanks. 
storage buildings. <laughs> 20 years of junk. David, I'm, I just want to say the same thing. Uh, I've worked with you for the past 13 years, and you've never, uh, you've always been there, and you've always helped me every time I ask you. And I'm not talking about 10, 1,500 times. I'm talking probably over 1,000 times you've helped me over these last 13 years, or maybe more. And uh, I, I can't, uh, I'm how, how much I do thank you. And, and hope that you really do good in what you're going into. And I hope so too. I wish that uh, I wished you wasn't. But, you know that's the way it goes, didn't it? But uh, thank you very much. Enjoyed you too, sir. Yeah, uh, I've uh, <coughs> I've also wanted to uh, disclose that I don't have any family working for a contractor for the housing authority. So I want to know everybody to know that because none of my immediate family are working for any housing court. But I'd ask one more thing of you. Mm -hmm. Who's over? Do you have anybody in here from, from that has anything to do with water program? Yes. Uh, Billy's here. Uh, could I speak to him? <laughs> Billy, we have a... Um, a really harsh problem <coughs> down in our uh, <coughs> district, and it has to do with Braggs. Uh, they're on the well. Their wells run out. Their people, our people over there at Braggs, are uh, boiling water to drink, and uh, when they need help. And the school over there is around 65% <coughs> Cherokees. And so, if you could uh, start working on that. You know, let me know what's going on, what's happening, so I can stay abreast of everything and, and go over there and visit with those people. I'll go with you or whatever. But uh, we need to take care of Bragg's Oklahoma right now. We sure will. Uh, we're actually working with them, with their yeah. engineer, uh, trying to come up with a solution for them. They've got a temporary line in, I believe, to uh, uh, the military post there next to them, Camp Gruber. Uh, they supplied water to Camp Gruber for years, and uh, several years ago, Camp Gruber put in their own water system to get water out of Greenleaf Lake, and they, they actually are now supplying water back to the town of Braggs temporarily. Uh, but we're working with the engineer there in Braggs and <coughs> trying to find a permanent solution to their problem. We're going to work with, uh, with them to you know, identify what that is, if we need to identify a new source of water for them, to drill new wells for them, or to try to get a permanent agreement worked out with Camp Gruber to get water to them, uh, you know, permanently. Well, uh, you know, I just got this call last week, so this this was one of our uh, citizens that's boiling water so she can drink it, and, and uh, her family, and, and uh, if if they're hooked on to Camp Gruber, then how, how long ago had they hooked on? How, Camp Gruber, uh, since that's a military post, they go through the, the state uh, National Guard headquarters in Oklahoma City, and they've been giving <coughs> weekly allocations. You know, we'll let you use water for the next week until you get something worked out, and I think they've, they've done that for two or three weeks now and allowed them to continue to keep water. The problem is they can get some water from Camp Gruber, but they can't get enough water in their system to get their pressure up high enough to lift that boil water. Uh, so it's going to take some type of a permanent solution, and we're working with them to try to figure out what that is. Okay, will you keep me up on that, please? I sure will. Thank you, sir. You bet. Thank you, thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you, man. You bet. David, thank you for your work. Good luck, partner. Thanks. You always answer my phone calls. I'll wait <laughs> to meet you time. David, I too want to thank you. I know I tried to entice you back, and you wouldn't take the nibble. <laughs> I, I can't understand why you wouldn't want to stay in Oklahoma and go to Albuquerque. <laughs> but I understand. I'll have you say the same thing in about six months. I understand it's a golden opportunity for you, but I want you to know if you ever come back, we want you back. That's, a, that's something to, I got that going for me. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Michael Lynn. Good afternoon. Uh, I 
think we're running short on time here. I won't take a lot of time. I would like to pass out a uh, handout real quickly that uh, Speaker Jordan requested last, ma last month. Uh, and while that's being passed around, I will uh, want to give an update. We had a community meeting, uh, what we call a free construction uh, community meeting and dinner held in De Delaware County uh, last Thursday night for the Twin Oaks Bull Hollow Project where the community gets an opportunity to meet the contractor, uh, ask questions about the construction, the sequencing, and just different different issues that they want to bring up. Had a good turnout, about 120 to 130 community members uh, had a good turnout and asked a lot of good questions. We're super excited about getting this project underway. Uh, what, uh, what's being passed around is a list of our current or active construction projects. That, uh, as well as the contractor that is uh, working or responsible for those contracts or projects, and the subcontractors that are working for them. The yellow projects uh, that are noted on there, I mean, I'm sorry, the yellow subcontractors noted on there are uh, HERO certified contractors. And uh, like I mentioned, this was requested at the meeting last month. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Tony? Um, My question is. How come there's so many that are not zero certified as of subcontractors? I passed out all of them. I'm going to borrow one back here. Uh, well, for instance, I mean, I, I, that's tough for me to answer. I mean, I, I can't really well, say. I mean, but let's I can't, take, go ahead, for go example, Mays County. No subcontractor is zero certified. Mm -hmm. I can't believe that we couldn't have found somebody to go up there that would be zero certified. Same way on this Barber Road that's right down here in Cherokee County. You would have thought we could have found someone that was Terrell certified to work a Cherokee County project. And instead we have Landscape, which is your smallest amount that will come out of that contract, is the one that we use for uh, we use for Terrell certification. Do we need to put a minimum percentage in these contracts? Uh, what do we need to do to make these primes understand this is Cherokee money and we expect it to go to a Cherokee pocket? Yeah, I agree. Then, now, there's a lot of these that are on there are specialty. Uh, for instance, Fenceco uh, may sound like a fence company, but it's not. They install guardrail. I'm not aware of any aero certified subcontractors. There are minority. There are minority uh, companies that do that, though. Okay, you can go I'm, to the state list and. There's probably a dozen of them. Tarot certified? Well, no, they wouldn't be tarot certified simply because they don't know to be tarot certified. But you can go to the DBE list for the state of Oklahoma, and there's at least a dozen companies that do the guardrails. And a number of them are minority-owned companies, Indian-owned companies. I mean, there's... About the only thing that you may not be able to get a minority-owned company in, and I, I'm probably would even disagree with this, would be the pavement part. Concrete, there's 100 companies on our list. And why they would not go to a Terrell-owned concrete company is beyond my belief when they're getting this kind of money for a road project. Uh, there is, uh, I'm really surprised direct traffic control is not uh, Terrell certified because I think they are minority owned. I think the the owner is uh, of Indian descent and more than 51 percent. So that kind of surprises me that that one's not marked. I know that you could have we could have got a guardrail company because my husband does state work and I know that they're out there and they're owned by Indians. Uh, same way with the surveying. We had surveyors right here in this area that would have qualified for that job. I mean, it just, that was, that's just an example, but this one right here in Mays County, no subs. No subs are Carroll contractors. Uh, Michael, that's just unacceptable. That is unacceptable because these are multi-million dollar contracts. And they're not, none of this money going to charities. If we need to rework our contract, but we should not let another, in my opinion, I don't know how the rest of y'all feel, but there should not be another contract left for a road project unless it's in the contract that we're going to approve the subs and we're not approving them unless they're tarot. 
we do approve the subs. That is in the contract. Well, then, plan. okay, then we fell down on our job. Did we approve all these guys? Yes. To be non taro we approved. How, how, Cedar Crest Road, what kind of contract is that? How many millions? Price-wise, two and a half. Two and a half million dollars. Your prime's not uh, taro. None of your subs is taro. Two and a half million dollars just left the Indian's pocket right there. I mean, it's just, it's just not acceptable. And this has been going on ever since I've been on the council, since before I was on the council. These are big contracts that we've never honed in on and made certain that we were using tarot vendors, and I think it's time that we look at it. It's all in what you put in that contract. If you tell them in that contract, They've got to hire those tarot people, then they'll hire those tarot people. If you don't put it in the contract, or if you let them talk, um, talk yourself out of it at the negotiation table, then we've let our people down. I just think that something, I think we need to review the contract and not let another contract until you got something in there that shores up that contract, or you guys get tough on tarot. That's all I'm going to say. I don't know what the rest of this committee feels like, but I think we it needs to be looked at. This is not nine dollars an hour job. These are multi-million dollar contracts. I totally agree with the speaker. These are multi-million dollar contracts, and this is unacceptable. I mean, do we have to form a? At one time, we used to have a committee called the Roads Committee <clears throat> before everybody's time here. I'm a little bit older than most of you. And, uh, and it took care of a lot of the roads problems. We, we addressed to make sure they were terrible. But uh, what are we going to do? Take all of these projects to council and review those one by one separately? That's just a recommendation. Julie? Can you go down through here and tell me how much each of these contracts are worth one by one? I'd rather get you the actual figures if I can, because I'd be guessing right now. Give us the estimate. Come on, Michael. <laughs> okay. uh, Barbara Road, uh, I want to say around $3 million. Shady Grove, uh, 750000 I believe. Cedar Crest Road, I think it's about $2.5 million. Cedar Crest Bridge is, uh, I believe, $1.8 million. Lee Creek Bridge, uh, $875,000. And Twin Oaks Bull Hollow, around $9.5 million. Okay. Could you send us the, the what the subs? Do you have anything with the subs? Can you tell me how much they're getting? Mm, I don't think I've got that information. I can tell you what work they're doing. I don't well, have I'll I don't, tell you what, what they're doing with paid. the contractor and tell them. We're discussing this, the counselors, and we'd like to know. Because I'm curious to see how much money is going out of church and pockets. I really am. I can tell you the work that they're doing and the amount that the contractor bid. How is that would that be good enough? Or do you want to know exactly what the contractor is paying? Because what I'm, what I, the number that I have available to no, me. I'd like to see that because I've had so many complaints from subs saying they, they submitted my bid for X amount, but I'm only getting X right. amount, which is lower. Yeah, because they're going to have their profit number <coughs> on there. Yeah. I'll give I'll get I got that available. Okay. I can get that. And I'm go, go ahead. Did the paper group tell you that you could get or you could ask for the exact amount each sub was getting, I believe, in a meeting that I attended with you all? We can get the information. I just don't have it available. You bet I can oh, get, okay. I can get the information. I just have to go to each contractor and, and request it. But if you wanted something quick, I've got I've got the bid bid amounts. Office. Go ahead and send them to us and then we get the amount. So you, okay, make sure I understand. You want both? Mm -hmm. Okay. Service. Yeah. Go ahead, Curtis. Yeah, Michael, on this uh, Cedar Crest Road, the general contractor there, did he know to? Uh, is he trying to get some uh, tarot contractors, or does he? Did he try? Did he try? Did I he... am not sure. I don't know the answer to that. Well, we don't have nothing in place to 
Currently in our contract we don't and we I have been in meetings with the Attorney General's office who helped us write the contract that we have now that we're using currently. Uh, we, we're trying to work on a mechanism to add to the contract or language to add to the contract to give uh, give ourselves more flexibility when it comes to awarding subcontracts to tariff, tariff contractors. I think we should in the future demand that they get tariff certified contractors to do that job. At least 50% on, on contract. 50% of the total value of the contract? No, 50% of the subcontract. I need to discuss this father and uh, I wonder if we shouldn't consider uh, and I'm throwing this to the chairperson of this committee forming a subcommittee where we review all of the subcontracts for the roads project and find out why we're approving non tariff vendors. I mean, if there's a legitimate reason that there, this is a specialty that nobody else is in, which <clears throat> I feel like with roads, if, if there was a niche that's not covered, uh, our Cherokees have tried to cover it. But let's say there is a legitimate exception, then let's look at it. But on the rest of these, I think that we just need to send them back to these guys and say, come back when you got one that's tarot. But, and I think that Michael probably in his office is somewhat hamstring, but this, this body is not hamstring. So if we want to form a committee to do that, I think that we have the wherewithal and the ability to do it. And I would ask the chair to consider that as a possibility that we give uh, uh, Mr. Lynn's group assistance and and uh, the approval of these subcontractors. Because this is basically $20 million in contracts. So we're asking for a subcommittee to, to set up a subcommittee to review the process? That Maybe we start with reviewing the process and see if there is a need to develop a committee that would uh, assist in the approval of these subcontractors. <coughs> That's in the form of the motion. I second it. Okay. Motion to form a subcommittee uh, to, to review the roads contracts. I think, uh, Mr. Chair, that's just within your. I think he okay. has the ability to do that without a motion or second. Just, just point of what I mean. My recommendation would be spend the next period of days determining whether it's warranted. I don't know if there's more information you can get for making that decision than you have to set up the subcommittee. Okay. Uh, I'll get with Michael. Let me get with Michael and we'll, we'll discuss this and I'll, I'll uh, set a date for subcommittee. Is that okay with the body? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair. I, yes, sir. We have some draft contract language uh, that has been drafted up. It's not been placed into any contract, any official contract yet, and it probably would not be replaced in any of these existing contracts. I would like to, with the, with the permission of the uh, Attorney General's office, I would like to share that with this body before uh, a subcommittee is formed to see if this would satisfy the uh, the issue here. The new contract style, you think, is going to fix some of this problem that we're seeing? I hope so. Yes, sir. Okay. That's just that's just my recommendation. If you could get that permission and send it to the full council. Okay. Thank you. And could I ask one yes, question? please. This year coming up, starting October one, how what's the potential contract amounts that you intend to let out? New, new contracts. Uh, <clears throat> probably in the neighborhood of uh, three to six million. For the next fiscal year, and then between now and the end of this fiscal year, do you intend to let out any other contracts? Between now and the end of this fiscal year, no, ma'am. So there's no new contracts on the horizon until after October one. 
that that would be my anticipation are correct. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you, Mike. Do we start a motion on the floor? No, we're, we're going to do it. Just, just Michael and I are going to discuss it, and we're going to, he's going to send us the new contract form from the general once he gets permission to do that. And we're going to look at that and decide if that's going to fix some of these areas that we're talking about. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Anna Knight. Um, I emailed out to Gail, and she should have distributed to all of you guys a um, report on the home foreclosure analysis. And it was really lengthy and a lot of information that basically said that foreclosure rates are going up and um, that there's not a lot of help we can be in like if you contact us early on in the foreclosure process. Um, I also did note in here that um, pre-purchase counseling is a very strong indicator of success. So we're looking at different ways that we can improve our pre-purchase counseling and maybe even expand it into the new home ownership program um, as well, um, working with Gary Cooper. Um, also, we've been working with Gary and Diane. We submitted a rural business opportunity grant to try to increase um, <coughs> training for people in the drywall and masonry business to um, to support some of the housing initiatives that are going. Um, I think that's really the only highlights that I have. Other than that, you have a copy of my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any, any questions, Lee? Thank you, Mr. Chair. It may be in your report, I didn't see it, uh, about the, you, you did start getting these foreclosure notices mm -hmm. for some time now, right? Correct. Or, okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the ones like back in March or April, mm -hmm. I don't know if those are the first ones or not, there's about 30 of them to date. Something like that? Um, I do not have that in front of me. We send that report to the community or the house, and then he includes it in his report. Okay. We just get the foreclosure notices. Um, but it looks like there's a trend. That's my point. It, in so. this, If you look at the kind of the report that I've done, there has been since 2012. There's been, and there has been an increase since March of this year in the Foreclosure Settlement Act. Many, many houses, um, hundreds of homeowners across the country, probably thousands, were in the middle of foreclosure when they dis determined that the banks were um, performing an unethical acts. And so they halted all the foreclosures. And then when they came to this foreclosure settlement act in March of this year, then all those foreclosures went back into process. And so they appear to be on the uptick. But most of them are already more than a year delinquent, and they've been delinquent in foreclosure for quite some time. So it is increasing. Rogers County has a high foreclosure rate, Sequoia County, Cherokee County. And the amount due the nation will that, uh, I know the foreclosures mm -hmm. will continue to increase, mm -hmm. but also will the amount due increase too? Or will it, is that a fixed number? No, well, it's a fixed, it's, it's, there's a maximum number per household, but as the numbers go up, the amount of money for the, um, that the Cherokee Nation potentially loses the, out of the MAP program goes up as well. And, and so what, what, how are we going to address this? Well, so the people that, that, that's part of my point. The people that are in foreclosure, there's not a lot we can do for them unless they contact us at the beginning of the process. And most of these people don't. We don't know they're in foreclosure until we receive notification from the um, primary mortgage. Um, <clears throat> what we have done, and in, 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 in the report that I had sent out, the majority of all the mortgage foreclosures that we've had to date on either the down payment assistance or the mortgage assistance program, 85% of those were before, were initiated before May of 2008. Since May of 2008, the foreclosure rate for those applicants has dropped dramatically, and that's because of the pre-purchase counseling that we've instituted. So for the, the MAP applicants that have already received their, their funding and are in foreclosure, there's not a lot we can do. But if we continue with our pre-purchase counseling, that number will decrease over time as the, as the program participants that receive their funding kind of level out. 
So, and, and we should see some leveling out within the next year or so of uh, foreclosures across the country anyway. In the 14 county area, uh, you think that it'll follow that trend nationwide? Or? It should, and it's below the nation. The, na the national average on foreclosure is much higher than what it is in Oklahoma. Um, and, but yes, we should see that we, ne we never dealt with the issues of um, all the homeowners underwater because the appraisals went up and so they were borrowing more than their house was worth. So we've, we've never fallen into that area. Um, but yes, the foreclosure rate should even out over the next year. And so you say not a lot we can do. So is that worst case scenario for these, these folks? Mm -hmm. For the people that are in the process that are that are probably 12 months behind, there's not a lot we can do. We've been able to process, I think, three foreclosure prevention loans this year to try to help some of the people that are drastically <coughs> behind. And, and typically, if they, if they will contact us within probably the first 60 to 90 days of their delinquency, that's when we are able to effectively help them negotiate with their borrower or find all, or, or their mortgage company and find alternative means to try to remedy the situation. But for the most part, a lot of the people either lost jobs, had some kind of severe um, ongoing financial crisis, and so, and, and basically shouldn't have gotten a loan in the first place many times. Their debt to income ratio was too high to begin with. They were picking up mortgages. They, and that all goes back to the unethical practices of some of the banks not verifying income and falsifying income in some instances. Thanks, okay. Andrew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good report. Anna, do you know whether any of our people were able to avail themselves of the deal that our Attorney General for the State of Oklahoma made? We are still having trouble trying to gather information. We're referring people to it and we're trying to help them with the application, but at this point in time, I'm not aware of any of our stuff. Well, well I have, you know, periodically you have people come by the mm -hmm. office downtown and I've referred them to them. To my knowledge, nobody is qualified. Mm -hmm. And is it my understanding that on the other end of that, if that money's not used, it goes to the state? You know, I would have to check on that. I'm not, I, I don't know about that, but I will check and see. Um, my, my concern is the, the rules have been made so harsh that people can't qualify. So on the other end, that money can then be utilized for the for state programs. I will, I will check on that because I'm not sure about it going back to the state for their other programs, but it, it does make sense. And Oklahoma's is much stricter than the national settlement that the other 49 much, states. Much less. Mm -hmm. It's much less, and if they were are delinquent, they can't basically, if they're behind, they can't qualify. It really kind of helps the people who kept up with it but received unfair treatment from the banks. It's, it's not a great deal, but I, I will check on that and let you know. So the people on out. this list, even if the, their primary mortgage was taken advantage of them through the two devious procedures that got a lot of the banks in trouble, because they're in foreclosure or close to foreclosure, they didn't qualify for the state program. No, no. And I wish that we could find a way to get the homeowners to contact us before because these are notifications that we're receiving from the sheriff's office or from the primary mortgage company. Um, and if people would contact us before they receive the sheriff's sale notice and we're a, you know, it gives us a little bit of leverage to try to find some, some way to help them. But, um, so when you are out there talking with your constituents, if, if you can, the sooner that they contact us, the more assistance we can be. But you're correct. These people would not have qualified for the state. Kind of just a plain answer to Lee's question, that column on the right, you don't expect to collect any of that, do you? I mean, it's a soft, soft second, and these houses are not going to bring what's owed on the first mortgage. So the second's not going to get anything, and we have no recourse. That's that's correct. We could we could go yeah, after a, a, a judgment against the, but I'm you know in my opinion, that those are people that are past, 
suffered a financial devastation and then to come along and try to get a monetary judgment against them is, is uh, it would be very difficult to ever collect anything off of that either. And I think uh, there's a opportunity to be short on even that. Mm -hmm. It is. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council of Houston. Yeah, Ms. Chair, at this time I'd like to uh, Move to amend the agenda. I know that I know we are behind schedule, but I'd like to move to amend for just a very brief discussion item, which would be a new business item number four. This would be a discussion of the William W. Lawrence Children Advocacy Center. Uh, we have a lady here that's just going to give us some very brief remarks, and that will come at the end of our second. Okay. She can come up after, after we get there. We're not there yet. Okay. Just take a vote on the amendment. Okay. Uh, Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All served. Passed. Okay. Thank you. And here's the. That would be number four, so now we're okay. 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 So the new business is, uh, let's see, Frankie, could you read out that 12 dash 099? <coughs> The res resolution authorizing the food distribution program to submit an application for funding to the United States Department of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. Second. Motion. Second. Motion. Any discussion? <coughs> yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to be added as a sponsor. Yes, sir. And Meredith and. I have a question. Oh. And I'll be added. Add as a sponsor, please. Okay. And one question from Ms. Watts, I think. Yes. And I'd like to be added as a sponsor, too, please. Um, and just to make sure I heard correctly earlier, oh, I guess I'm already a sponsor, so. <laughs> yeah. Jerry, thank you for your time today, by the way, and all your work on these issues. So there is there is the inclusion of the note about the Collinsville Center. It looks like it's been delayed on construction, but I don't recall seeing a new construction date. Maybe we don't have it because of the bid process you talked about earlier. So in this, the operating dollars are included in that original grant, or they should they be included in this grant because it's not listed on the end date? It's not. And... Uh... What we had earmarked, and Mr. Squirrel will come over just to help me out in case I get in trouble over here. We had money identified <coughs> in this budget to accommodate hiring the new staff of Collinsville. And uh, of course, if we don't get the center built, we're still going to end up with the money. In the, so the, the actual, budget. the actual food and those kind of things doesn't come in. Okay. USDA provides the food. Doesn't matter how many stores we have, they provide the food for us. So that is only for staff. Okay, very good. And, and they are they are budgeted in in this account here. So does this need to be amended to list them because the paperwork does not include them? I know that the resolution um, doesn't list them individually, but then when you go to the the routing form. It does not include Collinsville, and neither does the outline for Act Resolution Justification Form. Well, actually, actually, they were supposed to. We thought Collinsville was going to be was going to be finished this year. And, uh, we assumed that. We just, would. So, just in case you're able to accomplish a miracle, do we need we to include to that? Okay. We we certainly can. But I would gonna, hate for the issue to become a showstopper because we didn't do that at this point, if needed. <coughs> Would that include additional staff for? Uh, that's what we currently have mm -hmm. on board today. Mm -hmm. So the vacancies that we're supposed to be at 55? So you're right, they're not included in this. But we can certainly include the language that the budget will still accommodate the new staffing because the money that we would, or that we're currently spending on the development of the, of the new center, you know, we'll have that money still in the budget next year to add 
staff to know. Does that make so? So, if we pass the resolution as is, there is no funding. Just in case we're able to bring that online in fiscal year 2013, there's no funding for operating. There is more than enough funding. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the only thing we need to do is acknowledge this to 58 or 60 staff. That's what we need to do. But as far as funding for staff, there is plenty of funding right now. Okay. I just want to make sure all minds are clear because the way I heard it was two different answers. And I appreciate no, Jerry no, and Bud here. being here. Yeah. So I heard, Bud, you say yes, that we could accommodate Collinsville and we do need to amend it. And then I understood you differently, Jerry. So I, I just want to make it. sure. Let's hear I, well, I just understood that there wasn't any inclusion of Collinsville. No, we just didn't. We didn't put the language in here to say, yes, we have. We need to include staff for Collinsville. We just knew that we're going to have adequate funds when we get Collinsville built to accommodate the staffing. But it wasn't. Did we have a motion to approve? She just didn't document it. The technicality is the misunderstanding is right now. Collinsville hasn't, hasn't been exist. approved to construct yet. You know, we're still... Okay, I make a motion. I thought I made a motion. Hold on just a second. We've got a little... You made the motion to approve. Yeah, okay. Okay, but I would like to... Okay, I would like to offer a friendly amendment to amend the supporting documentation to the resolution to go to 58 staffing required also add a space and a line to include the Collinsville Food Distribution Center in Collinsville and list it on the routing form in the list of sites. Uh, let, let me ask a quick, Jerry, can you build this building by next year? If you get it. When, when you, not October 1. Um, well, I mean, this, yeah, when this, within this 2013. HUD, HUD only gives us until I believe it's June of, of 2013 to complete this project. And, and so you didn't include the number of employees in here, and that's what we're talking about. Is that right? So just to make sure I understand everything, the original projected completion date for Collinsville Food Distribution was March 2013. Now I'm hearing that we may face difficulties because we're supposed to complete it by June of 2013. This is for fiscal year 2013 operating dollars. We have a problem with the bid process and what happened in the budgeting. I'm concerned now we're not even going to get it built and we haven't included it for operating dollars in fiscal year 2013. You'll leave. <laughs> no, I agree with if we can get it approved, let's say, within the next two months, it should be a five-month project. It's a smaller building. It's a smaller building than nobody. It's nowhere near as fancy as nobody is. So it should be done in five months. So would the motion and the second accept my friendly amendments? I, I need to ask a few questions. Uh, Go ahead, please. Uh, help me. How many staff do you have in here now, Jerry? Well, the 55 that's included in here, as Bud reflected, our current staff that we currently have on board. We just didn't indicate in this description here that it would uh, take five more employees for Collinsville. But think, you have Collinsville in the mix. <coughs> you have Collinsville in the uh, resolution. You thought about them, what their, what their needs are. And well, I believe that's what she said here. Yeah, we didn't include it. But if we knew that we would have the funds to cover Collinsville because we're going to spend close to, what, $200,000 of existing money. At least that was our plans if Collinsville had gotten off the ground. And well, if you add three more people, if you're at 55 and you add 58, where does the difference in the money come from? Within the budget, next year's budget. We've got plenty of money in the budget. Right now we're... So you, if you get it online, you have the money to add the staff. Yes, that's me. I'm not going to accept the, the friendly. I, I I trust that you all have it in there, so I, I'm not going to accept the friendly. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'll make it as a motion, and the reason I'm making it as a motion is we are here to authorize. <laughs> how budgets are spent and authorized requests for money for federal dollars like this. And I think we need to be specific 
if we know it's coming online, we need to be specific. Otherwise, it looks like we're, I guess, targeting the, the Collinsville Food Distribution Center, which I'm not sure why. So I need a second. I'll second it. Discussion? Discussion, yeah. Let's don't make it a Collinsville, Cherokee County deal. Every time money comes up, that's what we try to do. We try to make it this district or that district. He says that they can do it. I trust that they can do it. This is not budget time. This is a resolution. Budget time comes, I believe, next week, isn't it? Or the week after. That's when we need to address it. Not here on this resolution. It needs to be addressed at budget time if it needs to be addressed. Bud Squirrel, how long have you been with the tribe? 36 years next week. Jerry? 39. I think these two have enough experience that, uh, that how to handle this resolution that we're preparing. I support your cause, guys. Okay. Uh, the chair would go ahead. Oh, I have one question. If we don't change this resolution, will it put Collinsville Food Distribution in jeopardy in any way whatsoever for fiscal year 2000? I don't foresee any any chance of that occurring, no sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. If we do put Collinsville in this resolution, is there a reason not to? If it doesn't make any, if you already have that, I mean, is there some reason to not specify no. that in this resolution? At the time that we were preparing these numbers, which was June, mm -hmm. there was not much of a chance, you know, in the future that, you know, we had all kinds of questions about Collinsville, whether we were going to build it or not, because we'd already put out one round of bids, and they were like 200,000 over for the first time. We've gone three times bid, getting this bid out, and right now we're 100,000 over the budget. So we're trying to figure out a way to, to, to construct it. At this time, you know, we didn't see no reason, because we, there wasn't that much of a promise there. Collinsville was going to be within the budget for next fiscal year. That's, so, that's so, why. so essentially you're saying that now that it becomes apparent that Collinsville is going to be constructed, that that's it's a not. Good, that it's not? It's not right now. It's this fiscal year. Not yeah, this fiscal year. fiscal year. Yeah, our current fiscal year. Yeah, But this is for 2013, yeah. and you're saying that it, it, it is going to be constructed at that time, and if... It's not 100% yet. We're still, well, it's we're like, still, you're, you're like, talking like, like I described. Yeah, like I described. Yeah. Uh, the request I mean, I'm not, I'm not the trying right. to be striding with you or anything like that. I'm just no trying problem. to, I, I, I'm just like, because it sounds to me like uh, the, what you may be saying is that, you know, given that there is a likelihood, which you didn't think there was previously, but now it seems that for 2013 that there would be, that had you felt that way, you would have included Collinsville uh, in the language of the resolution. So now that we see that that's, likely to be the case, why, 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 why wouldn't we put it in, you know, if that was the reason that it was initially left out? You don't know? need to ask me. Yeah, you know, I am. It's a rhetorical question. I'm not, I'm not asking you. I'm asking this body, I guess. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Let, let, let me ask, I've got a question here for Jerry. If we put the Collinsville suit food distribution center in in the uh, below still well. Is that going to help, hurt? What, what are we doing? You've it's already in material dice. And, and if it doesn't come through, then we've just... If Collinsville gets built next year, we have adequate funds to operate Collinsville. If it doesn't get built, we're going to have more than adequate funds to get through the fiscal year. Uh, Judy? I don't know if this needed to be moved to council tonight. I'm sorry. I don't know if it needed to be moved to council tonight for approval. It's a deadline on submitting. There, there's no deadline. Okay. USDA doesn't specifically require the full resolution. It's merely a process, so we have spending authority once we get it. Okay. It's, it's not. At this time, the chair would ask the, the motion maker and second to withdraw. If they don't want to, we'll go ahead and vote on it. Call for question. Okay. Uh, question has been called for, and we've had 
discussion and all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Okay, there seems to be some confusion. Let's do it again. What we're voting on is the the uh, friendly amendment that turned out to be a motion in the second to add Collinsville and to add the employees, I believe, three or five? Five. Okay. That's what we're going to vote on. Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. It was three. It was to, from, from 55 to 58. Okay. To add the Collinsville food distribution at Collinsville and to also make sure that the list on the routing form also includes Collinsville because, again, this is for forward thinking in fiscal year 2013, not this year. Okay. Any questions? Is everybody clear? So the yay is to accept the amendment. The vote will be to accept the amendment. Okay. Appreciate that. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Ayes have it. Now we'll go back to the original motion, which I think we had a motion and a second and a discussion. Anybody want to discuss it further? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That friendly amendment, I'd like to add as a sponsor. We need a sponsor in. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're going to vote on this, the original resolution. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? It passes. Uh, let's see. Going on down to 12-100. Uh, Meredith, would you read that out for me, please? 12-100. The offering the Family Assistance Department submitted an application to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for the LIHE program. And I would move for approval. Second. Move second. Oh. second. <laughs> Any discussion? I'll be able to sponsor. Any, any discussion? Second. Joe? No. Just add, yes. oh, add, you. add David. Add David Watts to Don't want to do uh, no discussion. Okay, so we're we're voting on 12-100. The resolution. All in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed. <laughs> Passes. 12-104. Uh, uh, Tyler, could you read that out for us, please? Yes, we would like to uh, have the body consider adding two additional advisory board members to the. Um, Housing Authority Board. Uh, as you know, that that board is uh, the work is increased on that board. There's going to be about 300 houses a year built through that entity, and uh, my understanding is we could use some more advisory members over there. Second. second. Motion is seconded. Uh, any discussion? I'd like to make an amendment to add a sentence on Section 4, Substantive Provisions A, at the end of the paragraph, to say that the attendance of the advisory board members and an agenda item for reporting out from those meetings will be provided at this <coughs> meeting. Second. That was after 6, is that right? It, it was Section 4. Uh, paragraph A at the end okay. of that paragraph, just because that's the only content, really. So just that it just should be probably just in that paragraph, I would think. I did hear something. Yes. Was that a friendly? Ms. Wood? No, that was a. I made a motion and Lee Keener seconded. To, to amend. Okay. Yep, to amend to add that. Any discussion? I mean, it's all accepted. Yeah. <coughs> okay, could you do the wording again for us, please? The, the uh, attendance of the advisory board members will be reported 
at this meeting and an agenda item for a report out from the advisory board members will be at this meeting. Okay. You want the advisory board members to report back to you? Or They're to representing the us, so yes. Okay. okay, any discussion? Yes, ma'am. That would have been a nice idea in the first four years I was on well, council if the advisory members would have reported. Okay. Yeah, the sponsor for a friendly. No I one saw was being excluded from meetings at that point. Yeah, are we d discussing her motion? Yes, ma'am. Not the original. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> Any other discussion? Okay. Uh, as far as the amendment, uh, Ms. Watts' amendment, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Now we're back to the original uh, act, and I believe it's been, yeah, we're ready for discussion on it. Call for a question. Call for a question. Uh, question has been called for. I have just a kind of a I'll go ahead. Yeah. funny question. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> On that same subset, substitute, in the substitute provision section, uh, it said that the board, the advisory board members, would enjoy all privileges of the board of directors except voting privileges. When you say all privileges, does that include pay? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Come and help us out. Mr. Chairman, all I can say is that that was just amended from the original of having two advisory, three advisory board members to five. So that was already in that original legislative act was pointed to three. So all I did was change the numbers. And so, in your opinion, <coughs> what it all includes. Well, my opinion would be just uh, the ability for discussion and things like that that just can't vote. Um, that if, uh, it needs to exclude payment specifically, that may be. But I just amended the original vote, so that's all I did. And it's my understanding, let me ask, that the advisory does not get paid. No, no, no. That's correct. Right. Does not get paid now, will not get paid in the future. Any other discussion? Okay. And is this an act? Say real quick. Is that correct? Okay. Show. Sure. Jeff Albright? Yes. John Garvin? Yes. Frankie Vargas? Yes. Chuck Hoskin Jr.? Yes. Tom Corey Jordan? Yes. Lee Keener? Yes. Dick Lay? Yes. Curtis Snell? Yes. David Thornton? Yes. David Walking Stewart? Yes. Kara Collin Watts? Yes. Bill England? Yes. Jack Baker? Yes. Joe Bird? Yes. Julia Coates? Yes. Jody Fishing Hawk? Yes. Mary Friendly? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are you awake, Mary? Right? It's passed and Council for Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I know the hour's late here. Um, just a brief discussion on the William W. Barnes Children Advocacy Center. This is, I'm, I'm a bit late to the party, as they say, to this uh, cause. Uh, other counselors, including Councilor John Watts, has, has uh, gone to bat for this organization in the past, but I happened to meet with one of the board members last week. This is a good organization that provides advocacy for abused children in three counties, including mine. Uh, we have a couple of representatives. The reason I wanted to get some discussion here just briefly is because we have budget hearings next week, and for a couple of years we've, uh, the nation has given some money to this organization, and I, I hope we will continue that, maybe even look at giving a little more, because they really provide a service that we don't provide and no one else provides that, that sadly needs to be provided. So we have a couple of representatives. I wonder if they come up and just share. We probably just have time for a minute or two, just kind of an overview, and we appreciate you driving over here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I'm Kenny Jennings. I'm a Cherokee Nation citizen. I also work for Cherokee Nation ICW, and I'm on the board of the CAC. 
And just a short part of my experience is that I'm also the mother of two um, child sexual abuse survivors. Um, over a decade ago, my adult son came to me and disclosed he'd been sexually abused by his father from the age of four through the age of 12. I believed him, but I was shocked because I was the most protective parent I knew. I had never suspected this. He disclosed only because he was seeing red flags in his younger siblings' behavior. Although we went through all the steps and reported the sexual abuse, the statute of limitations kept his father from being prosecuted. The younger children were questioned, but denied being sexually abused. Their father moved out and was granted supervised visitation. Eighteen months later, my daughter disclosed that he had sexually molested her from toddlerhood until he had been forced to move out due to the allegations of our older son. At this time, the CAC was in its infancy. Although we went there for the investigation and video, we had to go to each individual agency for their services. My son told his story 11 times to DHS. He talked to the workers, police investigators, counselors, doctors, and lawyers. My daughter was not yet a teenager, and yet she had to tell her story over 28 times. What a difference children experience with today's Children's Advocacy Center. Children tell their story one time. It is videoed one time. And they go one to one place for the doctor, counselors, investigators, and it's a child-friendly place with toys, video games, snacks, and trained individuals who know how to respond and help them through a terribly difficult time. In talking with my children, especially my daughter, the repeating of their experience, the repeated telling of their experience was worse than the hell that they experienced going through the court system, and it really is hell. As a mom, I always wonder what my children would have been like if they had never been sexually abused. But I'm proud of them. They are truly survivors who are able to look to the future with hope and enthusiasm and optimism. Sexual abuse is an epidemic and it is increasing every day. It's not going away. Please help the Children's Advocacy Center by supporting them financially. We desperately need the services of this advocacy center for our children to survive child sexual abuse. And please teach your children and your grandchildren, any children that you are around, about child sexual abuse. It is not stranger danger. It's not the guy in the park that has the dark glasses and the dark coat on. It is people they know, and it's someone usually that they love. Please help them, teach them to keep it from happening to them. Thank you, Wado. And we're open to any questions um, or comments that you might have. This is Holly Webb, and she's the director of the CAC. Thank you for having us. Nice to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate the opportunity to have these ladies come visit with us today and share uh, the story that, unfortunately, we, these services have to be provided. And I would ask that on next month's agenda, a request for $50,000 to their agency be placed on the agenda. Thank you. Excuse me, how much did we sign? I asked for 50000 for the agenda next month. And, and my, my anticipation is that we would address uh, this and others during budget time. We'd look at what we've historically given and, and see if we can increase that. There may be children advocacy centers and other parts of Cherokee Nation that we're not serving. We want to make sure we serve them all, but this one is the one I'm getting to know and I think does a great job. And uh, So I don't know if we'll do it on next month's uh, community services agenda. It sounds like it will be on the agenda for $50,000, but before we get there, we're going to have budget hearings. So. I think we should really uh, give it some consideration next week. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next meeting is Monday, September 10th, 2 o'clock, and the chair will entertain a motion. Second. 10 minute break. Motion seconded. All in favor of adjournment. Aye. Aye.